Well, uh, hi everybody. Greetings from Toronto. I'm actually in Toronto today, not in Calgary. Um, I'd like to begin by saying that I acknowledge we are hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat. Uh, we should also recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. Yesterday was Orange T-shirt Day in Canada, remembering the impact of residential schools and remembering that every child matters. I have no conflicts in the context of offering this content to you today. My declarations reflect my bias and values though. I share them willingly because they are my navigating tools. Your values shape how you utilize evidence and analysis. I believe people matter. You'll have to motivate people to change in order to achieve your goals. So start with heart and desire and then go to mind and evidence. It's important to remember that with every clinical challenge comes its operational and financial reality. In publicly funded healthcare systems, like we have across Canada, rationing supply is one of the most often used levers to control costs. As people who live here, work here in Canada, we have great expectations. Many expectations in acute care are often met. Most expectations outside of acute care, say in managing rehabilitation or managing chronic disease or long-term care, there exist major gaps between the public's expectations and reality. This is why our collective innovative and entrepreneurial action is needed now. So thanks for being here and thanks for the invitation to be here. This course, as the slide shares, uh, focuses on attracting four streams of individuals. And I realized that with the uh, registration today, there's a much broader group of people here. So thanks to you as well for joining in. The four streams are largely entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship, tech transfer, licensing, and translational research. This lecture will focus mostly on item number two. Now, to be clear, this is a talk about commercialization, not quality improvement or implementation science around scaling research-based protocols. That said, based on my experience, it might not take 17 years from bench to bedside if some of these tools were utilized by endeavors that require translation uh, but don't require incorporation. So implementation science has not richly embraced the business mindset or a business mindset yet. Um, students are evaluated in this course uh, on market analysis, including market sizing, segments, attractiveness, competitive dynamics, as well as analysis of parties and stakeholders in delivering and financing care related to their identified clinical challenge. So let's go. The importance of great market assessments is that they inform everything else. Your assumptions feed your set of integrated financial tables, which inform your narrative in the business plan, which informs your pitch deck to customers and investors alike. Investors will dig into those assumptions and integrated financial tables with their due diligence. So market analysis and derived insights in this context inform corporate strategy, business strategy, product strategy, all to create an operational plan, and then tactics are leveraged by people to implement said plan. Think of the process of commercializing a business as being similar to a plan, do, study, act, quality cycle in healthcare. Market research continually feeds into decision-making. You will learn something from every audience you interact with on this commercialization journey, so journal where you can and you'll reflect on it later. The six bullet points in this slide is effectively our agenda. Uh, fair warning, the last two may be rushed or omitted. Uh, I will cap my talk at 545 and open to questions. It will not be a deep dive into quantitative methods. It will be light on analytical methods for portfolio analysis. I offer you general guidance and an introduction to several practical and tactical tools I've used and have seen used with entrepreneurial ventures over the last decade. Sometimes I'll state the obvious or outline the basics, but I promise to dig into a few tools and provide references for your independent follow-up. The new standard of care technologies won't reach the bedside unless inventors have the skills to bring them to market. This is a quote from the course description. In 2014, I met Professor Martin Bruxton from Brunel University while we were both at the International School for Research Impact Assessment. This chart is from one of his papers on research impact assessment. 
The challenge being that many, perhaps most inventors, never intend to be entrepreneurs or become entrepreneurs. But often they become reluctant entrepreneurs because they realize that publishing patents as bibliometric measures of success is not the real metric of success. Many of you have realized this and that you must take an active, accountable journey, one that involves knowledge translation and scaling that knowledge into action, even if the mechanism of change requires commercialization. There is rarely a dynamic pull of innovation into a healthcare marketplace, however. Adoption by practitioners and the public will take great effort and you must become an expert in change management to do so. Remember, what you think might be a solution to a problem is an expensive research project until somebody buys it. And getting someone to buy it may be harder than you think. Your goal through ongoing market research and analysis is to proactively inform decisions that need to be made to make your solution commercially viable. Remembering that stakeholders buy because they see measurable value. Sometimes it's not hard to wonder if governments in Canada knowingly create what entrepreneurs and, and refer to as the entrepreneurial valley of death because of the way procurement happens or doesn't happen as the case may be. Last week, the University of Calgary hosted Mariana Mazzucato, referring to her 2014 book and her work since she spoke of public value and public purpose and of citizens as investors of first resort. Crowdsourcing has been on the rise over the last five years, but institutions can also do better. Imagine if a health authority had an economic development mandate as part of their mission. Would the health authority then be better able to accelerate measurable change to improve outcomes, improve experience, and lower costs per case? Maybe. Thanks if you did read the pre-read. The Key recommendations in our paper are just as valid today as they were in 2015. We need to consider health technology assessments at a systems level, but to motivate procurement, it requires bottom-up approach to measuring value, utilizing real-world evidence from the health authority to forecast potential gains around whether to adopt said solution, projecting how, relative to normal practice, the new solution will either improve or decrease a single measure of better, and whether it will increase or decrease the cost of the service. Ideally, quality is measured over the entire patient journey and accounting for direct and indirect costs at an activity level. Now, these assumptions I think are table stakes. We all wanna make a difference. We probably repress personal stories when we go to work rather than use them as motivation. Being a change agent means taking on personal risk and being vulnerable. Clinician and entrepreneur require different skill sets. And a few of you, and few of you from the class, I'm told, have actually run a business before. But well, there are risky assumptions that I'm going to try and catch right now too. When you interact with stakeholders and decision makers, remember that they do care very much about their people and their organizations and the organization's mission. They may not know operational metrics the same degree that an investor expects you to know yours. Frankly, that's why the industry of health economics and chart reviews exist. Above all, remember the first risky assumption. An organization is only a customer if they pay. Users who don't pay can play a valuable role in validating product design, but if they don't pay, you shouldn't let them call themselves a customer. I've made too many attempts to raising capital in foreign markets where a VC shuts things down because no one is buying at home, and that needs to change. There are some other basic terms that some of you who aren't in the class probably are familiar with, but I'm gonna make a point of statement here now Part of commercial validation, as I just said, involves purchase orders. It involves proven revenue or the process of proving your revenue model and your business model through investment. Nothing like somebody else putting money in 
to make things seem a bit more serious, but it's part of the validation process. Pivoting, like in basketball, one, firm, one foot firmly planted on the ground is about changing directions, being flexible, staying to your strengths, but at the same time evolving and letting the situation um, evolve the company and the process as you continue towards your goal. A pro forma is generally a forward-looking set of integrated financial statements. Balance sheet, income statement, cash flow, they all interchange and interact with each other. And the assumptions that you build through market research feed into that. We've already talked about what a customer means. Uh, ADCAR is a great change management methodology that's often used in Canadian uh, healthcare authorities, and you can use it just as easily in your startup to start building with A, which is what awareness is, and D, desire for change. And primary research, um, in my opinion, is always better than secondary, more lagging research, but it is about gathering data, even observational data, on a continuous, ongoing basis from the environment you tend to influence, you want to influence. So what's market analysis? Well, uh, there are many definitions. This is one. Uh, it's defined as a set of quantitative and qualitative assessments of a market. But it will mean different things and require different levels of detail as you grow your team and your company through different stages of commercialization. And we're going to get to that shortly. How to do market analysis. Again, many different ways of doing it. Even my old business school text has a variation of, of what this is. But in practical terms, this is a general guide and out outlook on what steps should be done in what order. We're going to focus a bit today on demographics and segmentation, trying to understand the market opportunity itself, um, looking at the target market, and understanding a bit more about the needs of specific customers through some tools that I'd used in Alberta. Speaking of old business school texts, I had to dig this one up just for fun um, in order to differentiate what a market is and what an industry is and in compelling what the difference is. Um, not that dissimilar actually to categorization versus segmentation. And I do find that sometimes um, people use segmentation when they really mean categorization. If you think of categorization as a list of facts, demographics, age, gender, gender mix, um, an ability to look at where people live, not necessarily why they live where they live. That's more behavioral. Segmentation is when you really start looking at what drives someone's behavior to motivate them to move in a certain way, whereas categorization is more like a fact. So in this context, think of industry as a group of firms that are relatively similar or are close substitutes, and they're building product. They're putting it out into the marketplace. The market though, more broadly defined based on behavior has a willingness to buy and they're doing so to scratch an itch, to fulfill or deal with a particular need or want. Healthcare, you might consider as an industry. Long-term care as a sub-industry, as would be acute care and primary care. Substitutes are easy, switching costs, are low for the consumer, at least. A market might be a subset, for example, of a sandwich generation, an adult child of parents experiencing early onset dementia, who are willing to pay for a location tracking device to safely help keep their parent, their aging parent, out of long-term care or facility-based care as long as possible, and are willing to pay monthly subscription fee in order to for that tracking device to help them fulfill that goal. We're gonna focus on market analysis, not on industry, which means you really need to understand your customers, their reality and their desire to change. Product on the left, company on the right. The objective of bringing forward your test assumptions, even though you may have built an idea from the clinical environment, whether it be a product or a service, whatever that solution is, there are lots of great granting bodies, uh, NSERC, IRAP, et cetera, federally, that are really focusing on product development, which is the, the right-hand index. 
technology readiness level, some of you may be familiar with, is uh, an old NASA tool, but largely used by Canadian granting agencies in order to think through where is that product uh, or solution in the context of being viable and ready to bring to market. It's more of a scientific and engineering approach to things. We're not going to talk in detail about licensing uh, in this talk. Um, we're going to talk about when you need to actually license it out to an entity and create a business around a product in order to bring it into the marketplace. So startup development phases in this context is the commercialization index or the, what's the wrapper around the product or service. Slightly differently is this startup development phase. I wanted to take us beyond product to look at commercialization readiness levels. In Alberta and other parts of the world, we broadly adopted this index from Helsinki to provide context to commercial readiness and maybe even investor readiness. And team building. Why are you doing the research? That's a question you always have to ask yourself. Well, maybe people are telling you you need a business plan or the purpose of doing market research and validating assumptions might help you mitigate risk in order to make decisions on where to invest your time and your effort and your money, often through the lens of those being scarce resources. On the left, in the early stages of uh, an idea coming into the marketplace, and it's negative on purpose, it's getting you ready to a point of making a significant commitment with your life to make it a full-time venture, not a part-time venture, not something off the side of your desk, but actually committing a good chunk of your life to commercializing the entity. Before that, there's a lot of concept testing involved. There's a lot of brainstorming, thinking through who's on the team, thinking through who shouldn't be on the team, why not? Thinking through who the customer is, where are you really going in the marketplace? So all the questions that we defined earlier under the market assessment piece can apply to really each of these stages. Validating assumptions, all of these go into your planning documents, including the pro forma. And that happens in each of these stages, but to various degrees, and usually in more detail as you progress. If you remember that people invest their time, their effort, and their money into people, those people create teams to solve or prevent meaningful problems by commercializing solutions. And I, you know, amazing that each of you are wanting to do that today. No solution requiring commercialization to reach a market grows without an entity surrounding it. So that's why I like to focus more on the commercialization journey rather than just on product development readiness levels. And the difference between validating and sizing a problem and validating your business model needed to bring that product or solution to the marketplace to be procured is important. The science, your science-based critical thinking skills will come into handy throughout this process. Part of defining, um, before we get to the practical and tactical, is defining what a strategy is. And this is one example from, um, again, uh, reasonable text from my alma mater. Um, strategy is fundamental pattern of present and planned objectives, resource deployment, and interactions of an organization with markets, competitors, and other environmental factors. Um, what's the strategy? People are going to ask you that question. What's the strategy to make your venture happen? And um, you may need to pivot or be modified as you go through those stages on the earlier slide. You know, based on my experience, the more effective strategies are created when firms really listen to the front line and take the time to understand how economic procurement decisions are made. So I'm going to take a B school, more B school kind of top down micro macro lens, but spend more of our time together on the more micro bottom up side of things as I mentioned before. Um, validation of a business opportunity and bring a solution to market um, is a big chunk of um, thinking through the landscaping. So what part of the health industry are looking to make a difference in and where? Where geographically? Um, are you talking about doing this from a home context at a convenience? Is the more likely consumer of your solution in a different geography? How do you prepare for that? Sizing in the market uh, becomes an academic exercise at the beginning, um, but eventually you do need to narrow it down into what specific behaviors can you change in what defined area in what period of time. Um, the dynamics of the market 
always important to look at uh, who the different stakeholders are, both on the, the buy and sell side. They all feed into uh, the planning process in your revenue. And I know that business model canvas is the next lecture. I'm going to not talk about that, but think you think about if you know what that canvas looks like. Um, I'll give you alternative approaches to that canvas uh, in a little bit. Um, but if you think about what all the different questions are that you ask to go into those different boxes, um, the best way to do that is just talk to people. Have 100 conversations, have 50 coffees or virtual coffees these days. Learn as much as you can from all the different stakeholders that are out there. Um, and just remember, if you're a well-financed ME or an SME with resources, some of these tools, um, even Porter's Five Forces, uh, may be more valuable to you. You might have the resources to go through and look at betas for financial projections, um, but not every startup does. So you use what you've got to start. Um, when you look at, and I'm gonna back up one second here, when we look at landscaping the marketplace and sizing the market, um, I refer to this as my Tom Noseworthy slide. Tom was a physician, um, health policy researcher, Order of Canada, who I had the privilege of working with many years ago. And he would say, um, defining, uh, you can learn anything, uh, or you can learn specifically uh, about any health jurisdiction in the world by asking four health policy questions. And I tie these questions into um, you making a decision geographically where to start. Part of defining the market that you want to influence and part of quantifying it is being specific about, like as I said, which province? Is it your home province? Do you start in the institution where you work? Um, making a market selection does not always need to be about what the province funds when you think about only 60, 65% of uh, financing of healthcare in Canada comes through the provincial insurance programs. Where to apply your strategies? Think about that in the context of these four questions. So basic, straightforward, who's included? What population are we talking about influencing? What do they get? What services do they currently get? What is the normal procedure or status quo behavior? And what kind of variability is there around that behavior in the particular market that you're talking about? Who pays for it? Is it the province? Is it only partly from the province? Is it a third party benefits provider? Sun Life, Canada Life, Blue Cross. Lots of mental health platforms are starting to emerge that are being paid for, designed by, or distributed through third party benefits providers these days. Don't forget, it's 35% of the market in Canada. We don't always need to start and focus entirely on acute care. How is it delivered tends to be the contentious, um, what's the right phrase? Polarizing probably uh, debate that occurs in Canada around our healthcare system. And the debate is usually a public versus private one. Things can be publicly paid for and privately delivered. That's a very common approach to things. Things can be privately paid for and privately delivered. One of the twists and turns on this, of course, is uh, a business model or a, a legislative act that uh, very few people know about, which is the cooperative model. And the question there becomes whether or not the cooperative model uh, actually means private healthcare or a new version and variation on public healthcare. I'd argue the latter, uh, but maybe we can save that for the Q&A. Who's included, what do they get, who pays for it, and how is it delivered? Um, becomes how you start thinking through where, where you want to apply something. And if it is a bottom-up approach that you're taking a product into a market that you've been a part of inventing, you may have some more restrictions than if you're looking at this as, I want to change the way that I'm, you know, my life course and make a difference and start with a big juicy problem and then find a way to dive into it. So a bit more chapter and verse for a few minutes on, on the B-School lens. Um, landscape in the market is about looking at total spend. But for example, if I were to say um, in the US, the um, market for antidepressives is $15 billion per year, but based on practice, and I'm not a psychiatrist, but I'm reflecting on a conversation I had with one that I worked with years ago, um, it takes a year and a half and maybe three different um, 
attempts at a particular drug and different concentrations. And so that gives you some understanding of where the spend is. And one might say that the, the market on depression is much bigger than that. But if you start by looking at where the money is currently being spent, then you have an understanding of, well, how likely is the solution you're wanting to bring to the marketplace actually going to make a difference in influencing where that money flows. Um, in the same context of competitive analysis and positioning, it's always good to know who else is out there. Basic searches that you can always do, uh, not just through Medline and looking at the research, but and looking at prior arts uh, searches on intellectual property. Um, getting beyond that, uh, including that, but getting beyond that, where do you start to think through um, what are called adjacencies or who's your indirect competitor? Who's the indirect competitor of people who are trying to solve that problem today in the marketplace? Who might they be in the future? You know, for example, uh, at a systems level, we had, I had some great hope a few years ago when Berkshire Hathaway said that they were gonna try and reinvent part of American healthcare uh, with Amazon and I'm forgetting who the other one is. Somebody can probably type it in the, in the chat box. Um, the, so the, the question was, could they actually you know, get better outcomes for their patient population by doing so? That would have created, and maybe it still could, create a huge competitive uh, approach to um, the large health insurance companies in the US. Now, now would they ever come to Canada? Um, I remember hearing a story uh, where uh, former Alberta Premier Rachel Notley had refused uh, allowing an American uh, health authority or health institute, where a very well-known brand, I won't mention names, uh, but to even think about entering the uh, Alberta marketplace. Now, the current government might change the mind on that, not sure, but the question it becomes, in, you know, especially in a Canadian context, look at competition not only through the lens of industry or of uh, the startup that you're looking to build or the product you're looking to bring into the, to, the, to the marketplace, consider status quo as an overcoming the resistance of changing status quo as competitive. And do take a look at um, the competitive nature or the relative competitive nature of the delivery of healthcare as well when you look at these things. Segmenting and sizing the marketplace, um, talked a bit about that already, um, but think about it in the context of um, drilling down and, and continuing to ask that why question, if you will, but drilling down. So, you know, if the, if the overall opportunity is, you know, X, whether it's 15 billion or it's a billion or it's less than that, how do you keep applying filters to help you understand where you can focus and then start to ask a bunch of questions around defining and testing, uh, testing out your business model? Um, calculating and sizing should be done I would argue through a qualitative and uh, healthcare quality set of metrics, um, as well as looking at the financial aspect of it. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about, um, about benefits realization um, in the next few slides. Specifically looking at what's free and, and what's not free or what's next to free, um, I've always been cautious about uh, expensive reports. It's, it's still for some reason, um, maybe big companies pay for them or maybe academic institutions pay for them, but they, they tend to be, and this is, this is fresh, this particular $5,500 report was, uh, was a recent uh, screen grab. Um, this particular market research company believes that they can, they can sell this to people and that's their business model. And it seems a bit outdated for me. Um, what I was really excited by, and I've been following and using this um, group for several years now, CB Insights, um, they just this morning came out with a Canadian digital health market map. Um, some of you may have seen this. If you haven't, um, go grab it because it's quite cool. They've done it in conjunction with PwC and taken into account um, the upswing in virtual, um, virtual care solutions. Now, for those of you who are in that virtual care space in Canada, and you're gonna recognize some of these brands uh, that are in the four different uh, categories, patient, provider, payer, and life sciences R&D. Um, some of them are, are maybe even friends of yours, which is awesome. Continue to you know, foster those relationships, learn from others in your sector, engage your competitors um, in a very open way to learn from each other. This happens in Silicon Valley constantly. And um, you know, there's, there's um, 
there's, it's facilitated in a way to encourage um, people learning from each other so that you can accelerate uh, the growth of a marketplace in a very, um, very open way. Last two aspects of this, um, again, I'm not gonna get into the details of, of Porter's Five Forces because I think that's well studied. Um, I will mention, however, that I was privileged during the time of my career when, when GE was kind of converting itself from being sales and engineering or oriented into being more marketing and brand savvy. We went through uh, a multi-day exercise with uh, Impact Planning Group, which is the brand I'm referring to there. And this multi-day exercise was with the entire Canadian product and services marketing teams. Um, to go through what, what GE had done to take uh, a version of Porter's Five Forces, if you will, internalized it into something that was called CECOR. It's a, it's, so C-E-C-O-R. Um, I'm sure there are lots of cases written about that. Uh, I did, wasn't able to find any, uh, only because I didn't have time to look for it. Um, but it was effectively Porter's Five Forces uh, and taking it and merging that with GE's worldwide product planning process that became Growth Playbook. This is uh, sort of circa 15 years ago. Um, I do have a great artifact from uh, Mary Abizia and Impact Marketing Planning Group about pitfalls uh, in the planning process, and that'll be circulated uh, after the class. Um, as I mentioned, best approach that I've found, uh, you know, and this is you know, leverage, leverage your LinkedIn where you, where you can, and if you don't have a LinkedIn account, create one and build, build out your network. Um, the, the three degrees of connectedness is really something that I've found useful over the years. Don't be shy, but when you do send an introduction or a, um, a connection request through a social uh, media platform like LinkedIn, always write a little something in there to tell, to tell them, hey, I met you here, or I uh, would like to follow up with you about X because it's really helpful in, in um, fostering um, and a desire to really chat with each other. Um, the other thing under research is just, you know, listen, 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 listen. I can't tell you how many times um, I've been uh, blessed with actually having people uh, share their experiences with me and then that just helps me refine um, the assumptions that I've made about a particular uh, product or, or uh, solution we're bringing in the marketplace. Um, this is particularly one example and I'm going to use this as a bit of a, a leverage point for us to get into the benefits realization uh, tools. Um, most business owners price based on a cost plus basis. Is the, is the error or the mistake that Mary is speaking to here. And how to avoid it is really to understand um, your customer's environment, um, what options or alternatives they may or may not have tried, and then use an analysis of a price to value perception. Some call this lean based uh, pricing uh, approaches, um, which can work. Uh, it's the same idea that you would use lean in a, in a healthcare context where you have you know, value added but necessary non-value added but necessary and neither value added nor necessary but you can use um use that lean based pricing approach to really at an early stage make sure you don't get caught down one particular uh trap of product development that's not going to give you a reasonable return i'm going to quickly translate um what the sort of a b c d's of, of the macro to some micro bottom-up approaches this is classic Steve Blank. Uh, so again, what problem are you wanting to solve? And who else recognizes it? Um, uh, Steve Blank, uh, for those of you that aren't, aren't familiar, um, you know, famous uh, Silicon Valley uh, entrepreneur and, and educator, actually. Uh, a lot of great uh, books based on uh, what he's been doing, especially uh, uh, Lean Startup, I think, was actually originally started in Steve's class. But this is, you know, think about the, the science, the scientist in you, but applying these hypotheses to different aspects of customer discovery. Um, customer discovery, by the way, can take place, you know, regardless of where you are in that health seeking index of, of the commercialization journey. Um, but the first, um, you know, stating hypothesis around your product, you know, around um, your customer problems, et cetera, I'm not gonna read this slide, um, but it all leads you to the point of, of verifying and validating whether you think your business model works, your go-to-market works, um, and whether or not you need to make a pivot. Um, in the context of testing out these hypotheses and understanding who to actually speak with, um, I would say these are great questions to start by asking. Um, and it's, you know, if you may know some of this already, you may not, um, but think about uh, who's really in charge. 
who is really making the decisions around uh, changing behavior in a particular um, market or submarket that you're wanting to attack, and then uh, where and how does the money actually flow? Um, this may or may not be known, um, and you need to kind of navigate that. And it may be done on a cost per basis. It may be done on averages and looking at case costing. Where possible, if you can get data from your uh, prospect that shows where and how the money is spent along a patient care pathway, as I mentioned earlier, that's always more beneficial. Um, and then understanding how the brand or the service uh, does through the eyes of their customers uh, or end intended beneficiaries is also important. Uh, maybe more applicable in other markets, but the Canadian marketplace is starting to become more and more savvy around patient reported outcome measures, patient reported experience measures, uh, maybe not universally, but it's a great way of um, using that kind of data to, to test out some of, you know, willingness to pay, if you will, on the solution you're offering. Um, Quick funny story, uh, back in the 90s, I remember speaking with a CFO uh, in Collingwood who said, I really am making a decision about whether uh, or not the hospital paves the parking lot or buys your fleet of, of technology at the time. And it was in the most, he wasn't saying it to be crass, he was being super practical. And you know that just remember, even though you may be thinking and promoting and building something to save lives, there is a practical reality to uh, even the basics of running running an institution, and, and the paving and parking lot example um, was one was one uh, kind of thing that always rem I'm always reminded of. Um, financially sizing it again, look look at the total spend from a top down perspective where possible, but also look at it from a bottom up. Um, I'm going to advance through. Here we go. Okay, this is this is fun. Um, we, so Kevin Ashobi and I, uh, who uh, we were on the same team in Alberta, at Alberta Health Services, um, we use this um, as a complement to what the Canadian Agency of Drugs and Technologies and Health would use for um, uh, health technology assessment. And in the context of uh, telling a compelling story um, that uh, internally, allows you to build a case for support. Um, that's, this is basically, and then again, happy to share this with as part of the after um, materials, if you wish. Um, it's basically to try and get an understanding of, of where is the organization today? Um, sometimes this is better done if it's at a health authority level or LIN level, as opposed to it being at a particular site level, but it is possible if you can rally together multiple organizations uh, within a geography to do this together. First step is measure where you're at, right? Measure where you're at from a quality perspective, understanding what your key metric of success is gonna be, um, and then forecast that um, normal behavior, which we refer to as status quo behavior, um, all those being equal, into the future. Pick a time frame. It could be six quarters, it could be three years, um, but it needs to be um, basically, you know, the research term being projecting the counterfactual um, into the future. The importance of doing that is if you start using run charts, um, when you look at applying your intervention, um, you can actually then start to compare your, your theory of change or your hypothesis as to whether or not you're going to create the gains that you expected and then the willingness to pay by that client uh, at a local level can sometimes be gained, uh, created based on that spread. Once you get through measuring and forecasting the current behavior, you need to actually project and forecast what the intended result might be from adopting the technology. Um, and for those students who are part of the tutorial afterwards, we're gonna do a deep dive on one particular use case from the paper um, that used this methodology in order to create that case for change internally. And then I'll share with you what actually happened as a result um, of, uh, of you know, best intentions, if you will. Uh, in order to do the forecasting of the change that you're intending to bring to the market, um, a user would then say, or a health authority or a hospital or whoever the institution is, would wanna know, does quality increase or decrease as a result of implementing this? And what's the forecast? Now we might say, hey, of course, quality is always gonna increase, but don't pick five measures, don't pick 10 measures of change, pick one, maybe two. Um, the important part of adding the second element, if you look at quality as a context of value and cost as a, as a function of money, 
um, then we also need to know what the current cost of delivering that service is. And then looking at that, as you said, where possible, not just within an institution, but uh, across a care pathway where possible. This is some of the wonderful work that the strategic clinical networks are doing in Alberta is actually mapping that out. And if it's, it's an extension of the work that we know has been going on at Intermountain Healthcare in Utah for almost 30 years. But we wanna know whether as a result of implementing the solution, the technology, the service, whatever it is, is actually going to legitimately decrease the cost of care delivery or increase it. And it could be that it means increasing the cost of service delivery at one point in that pathway, but decreases it later on. And the hardest part that I found, um, my colleagues and I at AHS found, is that it's not whether or not we can move the money in a gain sharing approach, it's whether there's the political will operationally in order to do that. Um, I think the best run institutions are able to work with their people to figure out how to overcome those sort of smaller P politics in order to invest and then reinvest in growing it. Um, we projected a portfolio analysis approach and is, this could be done just as easily within a, a company that has multiple products you're bringing to market as it can be in looking at different investments and change within an institution. Um, I'm using it here to show you how to put yourself in the shoes of a client, put yourself in the shoes of a health authority, looking at uh, choices they need to make like paving the parking lot. Um, but it's basically a, a low high benefits and a, uh, and a low high risk uh, of not achieving and basically making choices. And it's a Fujitsu model of making choices around uh, risk and return. And of course, you know, you have to fix a temporal aspect of this to make it work. I'm going to be mindful of time here because I did say that I was going to cut everything off in three minutes. It's 42 minutes in. Uh, oh, wait a minute. 546. I'm Ed. I promised I'd open it up for Q&A. What do you want to do? Um, as you like, Peter, if you want to, um, I don't see any questions uh, from uh, people so far. If you want to take five more minutes and then we can give people maybe uh, 10 minutes for the Q&A. Okay. All right. Um, business model canvas is going to be the next class. So I just wanted to quickly go through a couple of alternatives um, to, um, to that. So the uh, Daniela Pappy Thornton. Uh, is a former, I think she's a former associate dean at the Said School of Business at Oxford, but she's written some wonderful work um, on uh, social impact. Um, and this is an impact canvas uh, that basically says, you know, how do you walk around um, and really understand a marketplace? And I'm, I'm suggesting that social impact is a little different, of course, than um, technological impact, but if you believe that the technology or service you're bringing to market creates social value, uh, this is another lens of, of looking at, um, you know, where, where the marketplace currently is through that lens. Um, Jennifer Zwicker's work at the University of Calgary School of Public Policy did show over a 30 year um, uh, lit search basically that for every dollar that goes into social services, you get a 1.3 return off of every dollar that goes into healthcare delivery downstream. So maybe there's something to be learned here with uh, looking at impact gaps uh, from a social uh, impact lens and applying it to healthcare delivery. Lean Canvas um, is a variation on the business model canvas that came out 10 years ago. Um, your questions that you ask through market research can be channeled through these different uh, different building blocks. Um, what we found over the years, uh, especially recently, is that the business model canvas is uh, great if you're doing more entrepreneurial activity. Um, and if you're a well-established organization who um, basically has the resources uh, to, to move things more quickly or is well-funded internally, Lean Canvas uh, is a great approach that is much more focused on sort of the nimble, fast, uh, moving startups. And um, one of the tools that they have looking at stakeholder analysis is this customer forces canvas. Um, again, all these resources, all these, all of these 
um, examples of tools can be made available afterwards for those of you who want to pick it up, of course, and run with it. Um, the idea napkin is another one, uh, which is really geared towards uh, sort of early, early stage minus two, minus one uh, health CV index, if you will. And it's just, you know, part of helping you develop a narrative um, of uh, looking at, you know, who you are, what are you offering, what makes you distinct, um, who are you offering it to, and, and why does that person actually care that you're bringing that offering forward. Uh, this is a much more detailed version of that um, uh, napkin, um, but it gives you some check boxes and some rankings that you can uh, take to your colleague or um, hold in comparison um, to help you move along your, your business plan itself. These, all these tools, by the way, um, can be different components that go into your, your business planning and your modeling. Um, so yeah, Ahmed, we, we did talk about this, the, the potential of this actually having to be multiple, <laughs> multiple lectures. So I'm gonna probably stop here and do, do open the last 10 minutes up for questions. Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Peter. I think that was such an, uh, an enlightening talk uh, with a lot of key learnings and, and foods for thought for sure. And, and perhaps one of the most interesting ideas and, and takeaways uh, I think that you touched upon is the, to me, the idea to keep innovating beyond the technology. I think entrepreneurs and innovators uh, or change agents, as you named them in your talk, uh, need to become creative, not just with the products that they are designing and developing, but with the business strategies they craft to support their commercialization. And I mean, innovator, innovators need to think about business model innovation uh, or coming up with new and, and different ways to engage with uh, uh, stakeholders in the healthcare value chain, uh, aligning incentives, establishing unique partnerships and other non-traditional approaches uh, with the potential to overcome uh, common barriers. So uh, again, um, thank you very much. That was great. Um, I think we'll open up for questions. We have eight minutes. I see there is a question. What Canadian jurisdictions have introduced promising initiatives? Um, uh, so I would say many, uh, many, many. Um, the, so ex what are examples? I mean, you can look at, um, Maybe then maybe you can type whoever the anonymous attendee is. You can also type in as, as, we're, as we're responding. Um, the Canadian military has done some amazing things in their ability to uh, implement electronic health records uh, internationally with the defined population being all those in service um, uh, within the military itself. Um, there are, and that's, that's rare if you think about, uh, there is no one single electronic health record in the province of Ontario, even though we've spent billions of dollars um, um, getting us to where we're at right now. Um, other Canadian jurisdictions that have introduced promising initiatives, I think the whole mapping process of, uh, uh, that Alberta has been undergoing for almost 10 years now uh, of looking at care pathways uh, is definitely feeding into the implementation of EPIC, which is the critical, critic, uh, I'm drawing a blank, I'm sorry guys. Uh, Connect Care, thank you. Uh, the Connect Care initiative, that, that implementation probably would not be um, as strong or as effective in, in, in Edmonton, for example, if that pathway work had not been done ahead of time, it would have just been a bit more following of, uh, of what Madison had to say in, in the implementation process. Um, so lots of different examples. I think the a twist on that question is what Canadian jurisdictions have actually figured out how to not just introduce but scale the adoption through procurement um, and you know, that I, I don't have an actual answer for because I don't, I'm not sure that anybody has Thanks, done Peter. it well or not as intended at least. Um, okay, next question. Yeah, so I see there is a question from the audience uh, on how to get product approved with Health Canada, specifically medical device class two. Um, if you, if you want to answer that, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to stop you, but there is a regular lecture on regulation that will be taking place on October 29th, mm. specifically talking about health product regulation. Um, 
So another question is, uh, someone wants to get your opinion on how a healthcare business should price their products and services so that they have a profitable business, but it's not, let's say, uh, predatory. So contrast the healthcare business with watchmaking business where the Rolex can sell their watches for whatever customers will buy watches for. Since healthcare products and services are essential, sometimes life-saving, should there be regulations against predatory prices? Um, so I'm going to answer that question this way. When, when, when we were creating the health co-op in Airdrie uh, four years ago, we had a lot of people telling us we were going to break the law. We had a lot of people telling us that we would be violating the Canada Health Act by bringing 62,000 people together to be procurers of um, their, their health services, basically to have a, a stronger influence in the way quality and value for money was being used by the taxpayers in the community uh, and members of the city. Um, the, at, a, at a systems level, there should be a way to introduce competition on the, on the buy side, if you will, or on the receiver side. And we don't have that situation in Canada right now. We have the Canada Health Act for a very specific reason. Uh, it was in large part, as Tommy Douglas would, would have said back in the day, to um, bring some resolution to farmers losing their farms because of the cost of physicians and hospitals. So we have a great structure that allows um, certainty and the, the different principles, and you know, five principles, can Health Act, seven of the Saskatchewan Health Act back in the day. Um, the whole idea of uh, not having predatory pricing is meant to make sure that there's equity and equality and access, access being, you know, universal access being one of the principles of the Canada Health Act. Um, it doesn't mean that there are uh, services that are brought in where the willingness to pay may be there with a subset of the marketplace. The question I think is always gonna be, are you creating a public good or are you not creating a public good? Um, and uh, I'll stop there and, and just maybe point to a recent BC Supreme Court case that came out on the Canby uh, Brian Day um, case, which talked a fair bit about that question of yours and whether or not there is behavior in the private delivery of healthcare that becomes predatory or at least cannibalizing uh, of other aspects of the marketplace. And there are probably 10,000 words written uh, already that have been published by the BC Supreme Court on that, that would be give you a, a great reference point. Apparently it's a, it's a not too difficult read, um, but it would give you a, a heck of a lot of background on, on, on figuring that one out. Thanks, Peter. Um, I actually have a question for you. Um, you know, and, and I think you touch upon that in, in your talk. Um, I mean, the concept of creating value, you know, is, is widely understood in general terms, but it could be more difficult to articulate in the context of medical technology innovation. And, you know, understanding uh, what we mean by value is, is is, is, is critically important because it, it has a major an impact on how an entrepreneur will actually approach the innovation process. So uh, I have seen many, and maybe I, we talked about that before, but I've seen many innovators, you know, in, 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 interpret value as, as an expression of improvement in clinical outcomes and ignoring the associated cost or, you know, not including it in the equation. Right. And, and obviously value is not realized unless uh, the cost improvement equation is compelling enough. And, and I love the benefits realization tool or model that you presented. Uh, and I believe it's an incredible tool to guide innovators in this process of evaluating problems that are ripe for value realization. But my, my question to you is, what are some of the other uh, methods or models that innovators can employ to quantify value in this very early stage? Um, would you encourage uh, cost benefit analysis, for example, cost effectiveness analysis? Right. Yeah. Uh, so I mentioned Cadeth earlier, and, and, and in the in the next uh, talk, we're going to dive a little bit more into what's now version four of the HTA document that they produced. Um, you know, 23 years ago, when I first started learning about health policy and quantitative methods, it, it was it was a cost benefit analysis. And then it became a cost utility analysis. And then I think in 2015 or 14, there was the switch over to uh, cost, util cost utilization analysis, which accounted for quality adjusted life years and impact to an individual um, relative to the spend. And because we had, we had to do that because of orphan drugs um, largely, and what was the willingness to pay in order to save a life? Um, and it, it kept going up. It used to be 50,000 and then somehow it became half a million dollars. Um, so, 
Uh, different health economic tools for sure are one way of measuring value at a systems level. Those tools are meant to be used for payers, meaning insurance companies, whether the insurance company is um, you know, the government of Ontario or it's Ontario Blue Cross or it's uh, Sun Life federally, which happens to be the fourth largest health insurance provider payor in Canada. Um, each of them will look at the opportunity to drive change at a systems level based on the lives that they cover. The reason that I brought up the noseworthy questions is that I wanna make sure that you know, innovators and entrepreneurs of technology and services don't forget the other payors. It's not just the provinces. Um, and when you, but when you look at that as a top-down uh, component to, to looking at total value, and this is where I wanted to get us into that, um, you know, uh, the algorithm around um, uh, what the plowback ratio is. You know, I apologize for everybody that's not on the tutorial. Next, maybe those who are in the tutorial, we can dive into some more detail. The whole point of, of determining whether something creates uh, uh, a cost savings, not just a productivity gain, is that the CIO or the uh, person running procurement or the health administrator whose budget it is you're trying to influence, whether it's operational budget or capital budget, they all have to pay you and you want them to pay you in real cash, right? But if, they, if, they, if there's no mechanism for you actually creating, uh, freeing up cash in order to pay for or get reimbursed for your service, then you're by nature increasing the cost of healthcare delivery, not decreasing it, even though you might be increasing the quality of care. So that's why I thought um, it'd be good for, in the context of this audience, um, to juxtapose the more traditional non-healthcare uh, market examples with a bit of a, a lens from inside the health authority. Yeah, and this was more than great. Thank you so much again, Peter, for such an enlightening talk. It's almost 6.01, uh, so we'll have to end the session. Thank you again, Peter. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us tonight. Our next lecture is scheduled uh, for Thursday, October 8th, and we are having um, Hassan Jaffrey who will be talking about the business model canvas. So thank you again. Um, um, see you next week. Uh, again, please remember medical biophysics students, you have uh, a class tutorial in 15 minutes from now. So I'll see you shortly. Thank you. Good night, everyone.